Welcome to this OST2 lecture about TPM capabilities and TPM persistence. These are two important topics because TPM come in different forms. Based on the TPM vendor that manufactured your TPM, it will have more memory or a bit different set of commands. To learn about this, these qualities, there is an internal TPM2 command that we can use. TPM persistence, on the hand, is some kind of an optimization that enables us to maintain important TPM objects in the TPM memory loaded and ready for use in power cycles. As we experienced in this course, most TPM objects are loaded in a temporary memory. Most TPM objects are transient. Once the system is shut down, power cycle off, we no longer have access to the keys after the system is backed up, is booted again. This means we need to load our keys again, we need to authenticate to load them. In some cases, this is very time sensitive, especially if it's a primary key. For example, a primary key, TPM key with RSA 2048 bit can take a lot of time because TPMs are built for security, not speed. In these situations, we can have between three to seven key slots on the TPM for persistence. This depends on the TPM vendor, as we mentioned earlier. And this operation might look very attractive as a good trade-off. In some systems, like an automotive system, you can have up to a thousand keys. Seven key slots is not that much. This is why we need to be careful and consider it when using persistence command. Also, when we persist a TPM object, it will be there regardless how many times we turn on and off the system, how many times we power on and off the TPM. This object will remain loaded. That is the benefit of this operation. But at the same time, it means that if we need to load a different key, we need first to remove this key. This operation is called evicting and does the name of this common TPM to evict control. Now, this operation has its benefits that are just very sound in different scenarios. For example, you are securing a communication protocol using the TPM. Therefore, you need your digital signing key available at all times. You do not want to have latency for the digital signing operation to load the key every time between reboots or for other reason. This is a valid case. You just have to keep in mind that this, there is a very limited storage for such operation as persistence. Let's look at the command. Persisting a key is as easy as removing the key. This is why we need to make sure that there is authorization control for the hierarchy and then our security will be compromised. To change the authorization of a hierarchy or any TPM object, there is a special command called TPM to change out. We will look at this command deeper in the next slide. Once we set an authorization to the hierarchy, then what's important is to have our object created or loaded to be in transient memory and then to instruct the TPM, this is our object, this is the authorization for this object, please make it permanent. And you see the example on the slide and the typical output when you have a success. You receive back a handle. This is a number of the slot where the key was put. You have the option to select which slots do you want, but typically it's best to either allocate the next available slot and handle the response or have a predefined set of the slots, meaning that I'll have my digital signing key at slot zero, I have my TOS key slot one, I have my attestation key at slot two, and then the rest of the slots, if available, I'll just know they're available if I need to do something with more keys. This is a very good approach to have it designed in advance. Of course, again, it is rarely the case that we need to persist so many keys. Depending on your scenario, you have to make that choice. Now, let's take a closer look at the change out command that we used in this example. The change out command is very important and very simple at the same time. It takes just a few parameters. Usually we have a hierarchy to select using the dash C parameter, and then we need to set a different authorization, usually with the dash P, which is some kind of a passphrase. On the slide, you can see different examples of changing the authorization or removing it altogether. Maybe for development purposes, you need to have an empty password temporarily. 
there is a way to do that. Of course, the TPM2 change out command can be used not only on hierarchies, but also on TPM objects. The important thing is for them to be already loaded. And then we need to make sure that we provide also the parent to that TPM object when we want to change its authorization. This command supports parameter encryption because it works with sensitive data. To pass a policy session or HMAC session to enable parameter encryption, use the dash C argument. And do not forget to, when creating a session with TPM to start out session, to also include a primary object to add bind and salt to your session. This makes the parameter encryption really stronger and gives you the highest guarantee against machine in the middle attacks. Now, let's get back to our persistent object that we made in the previous slide. For some reason, we need to remove our persistent key. It could be that we are rotating keys. It could be that we run out of persistent key slots. And for the next process on our system, we need a different key. Maybe it's, it is an upgrade process. This could happen more often than you think. In this situation, it is important to know that we can use the same TPM2 evict command as last time, TPM2 evict control. We need to provide the hierarchy of the object that we need to evict and the proper authorization. Remember, if you haven't set an authorization for the hierarchy, then you have an empty password, which is okay to try the command, but this also means that anyone on the system can remove your persistent key and thus break the system. So it is important if you decide to persist a key, make sure to set the hierarchy authorization. This is a recommendation in all cases, but just even as you're developing, it's good to have that already built in your code or your flow. Then the last parameter is very important as well, the handle. Remember, this is the outcome of the first time we ran the comment. This was the output on, upon success. We were given the address where our key is persisted. Usually, uh, this is one of the key slots, so only the last digit of the handle number differs, but it is good to have that number somewhere written, stored, or just in general, as part of your application defined. So you can then remove the key and remove the right key. Here we come to the TPM2 capabilities. If you notice on the previous slide, there is a command that helps you find out what are the persistent handles currently in use on this TPM. And that's valuable, especially if in the course of using the TPM, maybe there are older users, older processes that are using it. This is why, as we mentioned, it's important to have different hierarchies, different hierarchies, authorizations, and so on and so on. Now, the command comes with many options. In my experience, most frequently, I need to check either for a comment or for a supported algorithm. And we will look closer of the various uh, things we can list. I definitely recommend looking at the help of this command because there you can see all the supported capabilities that we can list. Um, handles also something that very often can come to mind. What are the current handles in use, transient, persistent, NV indexes, and so on. Very useful comment, especially during development, but not only during production. You can also use this comment to make some decisions depending on how many users are on the platform. This is a big factor, usually. And another I think an uh, interesting aspect of the comment is the uh, properties. There are two uh, sets of this comment. There's the um, uh, TPM to get cap properties fixed and properties variable. Properties fixed are uh, properties that we cannot change. This is how the TPM was manufactured. Where the properties variable shows us some of the capabilities of the TPM that are already in use or have not been used. For example, here we can see if we have set an authorization to the owner hierarchy or the endorsement hierarchy. In this screenshot, you can clearly see that the owner hierarchy has its authorization changed from the default empty. And for the endorsement authorization, we have not done so. Also good to see if it's a managed machine, 
you can visualize uh, which of the hierarchies are currently available on the system. This is important when you have a managed system or a more closed system that uses a TPM, but still you have access to the TPM to secure your third party application. I think it is great to start from just listing um, the available subcommands to the TPM to get cap to. I definitely suggest trying all of the available options and just looking through the TPM to get cap algorithms is very interesting. You would see different codes for the different algorithms, but it gives you a sense of what's available, especially if you are using symmetric algorithms. They are export regulated, so your TPM most likely will have a different set from a different manufacturer, ordered from a different place, and so on and so on. So I highly recommend using the get cap command on a TPM before starting development just to see what you have on the TPM that you've chosen for your design and your system.